Doing a little sound check here for everyone. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat window. I had typed something about LinkedIn. Uh, if you consider following us on LinkedIn, uh, a couple other announcements when we start, but I just wanted to make sure the audio is looking okay or not looking, sounding okay if people can hear me. A little bit of an audio check if, if people are out there and can hear me, if you do something in the, uh, put something in the chat window, that would be great. Getting more people starting to come in. All right. Seems like the audio is good. Thank you. So this webinar is a little bit earlier than the other ones, I believe. Um, and the next couple, we're going to switch to afternoon to, to catch more of the people on the West Coast. Um, I believe the next two coming up. If you have not registered, uh, it's mhforce.com. And those dates are uh, May 2nd, the Force of Decision Rules, Metrology Meets Star Wars is the next one coming up that's again on may 2nd if you haven't registered and that one is going to be at two o'clock to 3 30. that being said i don't know how many people are struggling with decision rules uh you are probably there's a draft document that we put up on linkedin and a final document not not the end all be all final document but a final document on decision rules uh the initial release that's out of draft copy will be released next week. So anybody that is struggling with decision rules, Greg Sanker, um, Dilip Shaw and myself have put this together. We have all come through hours, hundreds of hours of material, uh, standards and everything else in the hopes to simplify decision rules for everybody that may need help with them. So. If you want, you can sign up. Uh, be sure to sign up for a newsletter. We'll announce it there, but LinkedIn's probably gonna be the first to have the announcement. And if you can go to the chat window, if you do not follow Morehouse, I encourage any every, everybody to consider following us on LinkedIn. So that's a bit of a brief. There's also this uh, presentation, there's a PDF. It's in the handouts on here. Uh, you should be able to tick click the tab handouts uh, and download this one. And if you have any questions, uh, we're scheduled to 1130, but we have a lot of time for questions and answers after this presentation. So please ask them um, and I'll be monitoring that window um, as well. So if you have a question, please feel free to ask it and we'll get around to answering whatever they may be after um, at some point during this presentation. So with that said, by buying a little time, it's 10.02. Normally people, you get the last few people coming in uh, at, at between the 10 and, and between 10 and 10.05. So I can start with a bit of a beginning on this. This webinar, Optimizing Universal Calibrating Machines. Obviously people are here, they may have calibrating machines, they have may have an interest in machines, they may be, have an interest in automation. We're gonna talk about all of this. We're gonna talk about universal calibrating machines. We're gonna talk about adapters, the importance of adapters, and a little bit about us as those last few people come in. We manufacture force calibration products such as the Morehouse UCM. We provide force measuring equipment calibration service using international standards and, of course, domestic standards, ASTM E74, ISO 376. Uh, we are credited to ISO IEC 17025. We still hold, we just 
passed our A2LA uh, accreditation. They were just here this week. Um, we can perform calibrations in accordance with ANSI Z540.3 2006 if requested and uh, other specifications and work with you uh, as far as conformity assessments, pass, fail uh, type of things. We just just drafted that document on, on decision rules. As I told the other people, if, if you're not already following us on LinkedIn, please connect, follow us. And we enable customers to make better measurements, which makes the world a safer place. And we're, we're gonna talk about all of that. Our purpose is what drives us to come to work each day is recreate a safer world by helping companies improve their force and torque measurements. And we have deadweight standards accurate to better than 0.002% uh, of applied force, up to 120,000 pounds of force. Most people we find that have calibrating machines, uh, there are some people, uh, some customers that have 500,000 machines, 300,000 machines, million pound machines. Most are operating in a, some sort of range of 100,000, 30,000, even 10,000, and then below that we pick up with our PCM. Uh, however, we do offer force calibrations. I know they're, it's rare, uh, but you know the handful of companies we do business with, we go up to uh, 2.25 million pounds of force or 10 mega, mega newton. My name, for those that do not know me, uh, my name is Henry Zumbrun II, uh, president of Morehouse Instrument Company, and I've been making force measurements for uh, over 25 years. So hopefully, uh, just in the lab before before coming to this webinar and doing a little bit of uh, troubleshooting in there where we cannot figure out one of, uh, cannot replicate uh, something. And I think anybody that's been in a calibration laboratory, someone has some weird condition and then we go try to replicate it. And it's sometimes when things are intermittent, they're very difficult to replicate. So that's, that's where we're at now doing, I left while we were doing some uh, more testing and it certainly it seems like uh, what we are doing is not on us and it was just some weird coincidence, maybe a wrong adapter, maybe something else uh, used at the other, the other site. Um, anyway, outcomes for today. Participants will learn about problems that exist uh, when calibrating a force measuring instrument, adapters that reduce errors, and how to get the best uncertainty from a Morehouse universal calibrating machine. Agenda, a uh, little bit of calibration headaches uh, typical error sources and force calibration, adapters that reduce errors, errors, uh, UCM automation, and a bit about UCM uncertainty, which we do have a document. I can share that at the end of the presentation. Uh, I should have uploaded it beforehand um, in that document is how to do an uncertainty budget when using a UCM. So we've made that piece a bit easier for people. I know quality managers and people in quality, if your company has a quality department, often struggle with that. And that's why we created that that document um, for this and it's just step-by-step -step guidance of how to go through and do an uncertainty budget we've also recently if you do follow us on linkedin you know announced that we updated our cmc uh uncertainty spreadsheet so both of those uh we can show links where to get them on the website um, and uh, paste them in the uh, chat box for people to download okay so some calibration headaches, uh, it's, yeah, here, it's pictured right. I mean, a lot of people are making calibrating machines and people make them differently. Some do tension and compression in the same setup. Some have separate setups for compression and, and tension. ISO 376, that international standard, encourages separate setups for tension and compression because you have different adapters. Uh, it's all about the adapters, ensuring the uh, proper alignment of the force. In any case, uh, the UCMs are very, you know, they're called universal because they can calibrate almost anything with the proper adapters. And they are just thrown a hodgepodge of different equipment from button load cells, tension links, um, you know, dynamometers, S-beam load cells, force gauges, you name it. Um, some people have even got cable, cable tensiometers in the machines. I don't really recommend that. We have our own machine to cable tensiometers. That's much safer than putting in a UCM, but they've done it. So some of the headaches you may have uh, are problematic setups, missed revenue opportunities, costly reference standard dual mode calibration. So what that means is uh, some machines have reference standards that are used in both tension and compression. And when that happens, you need them calibrated in both tension and compression. 
and you also need to really exercise those standards numerous times. Sometimes two exercise cycles are not enough and you need, you need three, four, or five exercise cycles when switching modes. So that's uh, a, a little bit of the convenience is everything is in one setup. Uh, the inconvenience is you have to exercise uh, the standard, uh, the reference standard a lot more, uh, pay higher calibration costs, and then we go back to the ISO 376 where the recommendation is to have different adapters for compression and tension because usually load cells or the instruments have different setups and adapters. Other uh, headaches, unidentified uh, errors, time-consuming rework, and then assumptions on your calibration accuracy on uncertainty. And hopefully that guidance document, which we'll share later, will, will take away a lot of those assumptions. And then not all machines are created equal. Uh, we designed our UCM to accommodate almost any force instrument from crane scales to button load cells. And for those that cannot be calibrated, such as aircraft and truck scales, we have a solution for those. That's our uh, USC 60K machine. So. Universal testing machines, uh, this is here because many people use these as calibration standards. And just just if you are using them, uh, they're used as universal test or material testing machine or tensile testing. Often they're used to test the uh, tensile strength and compressive strength of materials. And the most, most machines of this nature I've seen are generally uh, good to 0.3 to uh, through 1% and very few labs can calibrate other force measuring instruments better than 0.25%. And that number comes from ASTM, assuming the device was calibrated to use a class A verified range of forces. So assumptions there. I mean, there are tensi there are there are machines that are really great, uh, and there are other machines that where you're not going to get that that much out of it. So this is a ballpark. Uh, if you have a testing machine and are getting 0.5%, it that not that's a a, a great um, CMC uncertainty parameter for that machine. Uh, what I'm saying is it's just not common, but there are people out there that are making very good machines better than this generalized slide. So uh, typically, this is that CYA or CYB cover your butt, saying words like typically because there are some that are better. It's uh, They're typically above 0.3%. Uh, some are much better. A universal testing machine may be used to apply a force. Uh, a well-defined reference standard calibrated by primary standards is used in combination with the load cell in the frame for control only. And then I made the, the note there that uh, a CMC uncertainty parameter of 0 0.05 may be achievable. So other things, uh, types of machines, servo-controlled calibrating machines. Um, CMCs are better than uh, 0.05. They're not well suited for calibration of all equipment. Um, often calibrate quickly and use different timing profiles other than some of the recommended, some that are recommended by standards. Uh, some standards require the force to be held for 20 to 30 seconds. These machines can do it, um, but they're, they usually, people do not set them up to do that. And the ability to hold force is questionable uh, for some of them. Uh, they tend to cost about double than a comparable Morehouse UCM. That's without auto, without the automation. Um, the recurring calibration cost is higher as they require the reference to be calibrated both tension and compression. And if the only requirement for production load cells, depending what you're calibrating, often depends on what reference equipment makes the most sense. And if you're just, if you're doing a production load cells uh, where you're just doing five point calibrations, these might be the excellent fit. We've had people ask us um, specifically about a UCM for for those occasions in which we said this we've said this is a better fit. Uh, it's just evaluating all the factors. So hopefully today you'll get all the knowledge you need if you don't have uh, if you're looking for uh, reference equipment to figure out what you need and and what you want to do. Now we can calibrate the load cells that go in these machines with deadweight primary standards. That certainly will help lower your certainty, and we'll talk about it later. Um, so one of the best tests uh, here is if you have one of these machines or you built your own machine or using a testing machine is to do participate in PT testing, uh, get involved with that, NEPT, Sapphire, other companies out there have force PTs. Those are the two that I know of that do a really good job uh, if you're interested in that. Or th what I like better is do a direct ILC, which is an interlaboratory comparison with good reference standards. So we do have rental load cells if you have a machine 
and we do have we've done all the excel templates and everything else where you can use these templates to to do your own pt which basically we calibrate a load cell and dead weight we ship it to you we know what the value should be you put that load cell in your machine you get the value you you record the outputs and then you compare the outputs against what we got calibrated in dead weight that will give you uh the the sheet will give you an en ratio and a z score those numbers really determine if you have your cmc uncertainty parameters or your uncertainties right and that will let you know your true capability and that is just between us um we can send it out where we never see your results uh you fill in the sheets uh it's you can self-certify them it is a big help if you want to know those extra error sources and if you want to fine tune your machine oftentimes i'll recommend somebody do that before they participate in a formal pt because that helps you gain confidence that's you really don't want to get to the point where you fail your pt it's it's a lot easier to know that answer right know what it should be and maybe play around with your setups play around with am i using the right adapters is my technician overshooting points all of these other things so cal machine I like these machines. Uh, I think they're really good to calibrate the wide range of instruments that can come into a laboratory. Uh, they're easy to use for compression and tension calibration of force instruments. Uh, the machine matches the accuracy of the reference standard often. Uh, this is assuming someone knows what they're doing with the machine. And there also are things like plumb level square rigid where if there's a little bit of misalignment in the, in the machine, uh, that you can find these things on the load cell specification sheet. So a lot of it depends on the load cell. The machines are we make are not perfect by any means. They're not you know perfectly level, perfectly plumb, though they're machined and machined very close. And we keep all of these things in mind. Uh, there's you want to watch something funny, you go watch uh, Rick and Morty on Perfect Level. That's a show on I think it was Adult Swim Comedy Center, or, or I think it was on Adult Swim co on Comedy Central. But anyway, yeah, nothing. If we look at everything under a to to the nth degree, uh, nothing's ever going to be perfectly level. Uh, so, but we, we do a good job machining and make them as close as possible. And then what people always want to know is, Hey, what's my calibration and measurement, uh, capability uncertainty parameter? How good can I get these machines? Helping several labs, you can get these machines to, oh, typically O2 to O3 or better. Uh, that's, uh, and I'll, I'll show you some examples here coming up on, automation versus not automation if your technician is seasoned and knows how to use the machines and pays close attention to controlling the force these are realistic numbers if you're going fast uh the uh, the most the uncertainties go up a lot of the customers i've helped with budgets over the years are have fallen between 02 and 04. uh it's just our lab we're following uh well below the 02 mark on these machines so it, it really depends on the training and how well the technician can hold the force, assuming you don't have automation because automation is, is a game changer. Uh, Add-on can be added whenever. So when we say optimizing UCMs, a lot of times people don't, may not have the budget for a full machine. Uh, full machine automation and all the accessories and adapters needed, that's a business case. Someone has to make that decision. The nice thing about how we designed our machine is that the automation can always be added as an upgrade. So maybe year one, you buy a machine, technicians learn to use them. Year two or year three, workload starts increasing. Hey, now I have more work, I need to get it done. If I automate, chances are I can increase my throughput, which is a word for you know getting things through the uh, facility by 25, 50%. Uh, without having to get a second te technician or a second shift. So these are like important parts that if you already have a UCM and you're backed up, your lead times are, you know, 10 weeks, what's it look like if you can reduce that 50% to, to five days? What's it look like if you can reduce it 40% to six days? These are things you have to think of as business uh, when you run a business or, or or, or seeing overseeing some part of a business on hey i can make a one-time purchase that i don't have to i'm not advocating never to hire people or anything but i can make a one-time purchase here where i don't have to pay a second person i don't have to pay benefits i don't have to worry about if they show up i don't have to worry about um 
I'd still have to worry about training, but not as much. I can have some pro procedures and, and other things in place where I can increase my overall the work that's going out the door or, or the throughput. And then a Morehouse automated UCM with two to three load cell standards. Uh, this is another business case that people need to make, can achieve CMC uncertainties of better than 0.1% throughout the loading range. That is another case. Do I want to be switching? Do I want to take high, higher uncertainties, switch less standards, or do I want to make several switching of standards? I usually, when I talk to people, say, what is your workload? If somebody says I have 100 of this, of 110,000 pound load cells that I anticipate coming in, or 200 that I come in and calibrate over a year, you might say it's probably great. It's probably your best bet is to buy a 10,000 pound reference because then you can do those. Do not try to split that those uh, 10,000 pound load cells between a 25K reference and a 5,000 pound reference because then your technician is going to be switching standards for 200 times a year where if they bought a 10,000 pound reference, they may not have to. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, that's coherent to people. You think about, write down the list of work that you have and what you need, and then you can work backwards on what reference standards make the most sense to optimize your process. So before we had automation, I was pretty darn good at doing repeatability studies and doing all, all of that on our end uh, for our budgets. and all of our techs were as well because we trained them and showed them and they got to spend lots of time uh, practicing. So what you're seeing here though is the CMC, uh, I said automation, these are preliminary results. We're doing another round of testing now with all five of our technicians. Um, this is These are preliminary results from automation and the technician. Um, some of the things. And what we did here, it's just a 100,000 pound load cell. Uh, remember I said you, people might want to substitute out, uh, you know, maybe they want to substitute it if they want to maintain 01 or better. Uh, you can see here that, you know, that's not happening. If maybe you want to maintain 02 or better, right here at 20,000, uh, it's a little bit above O2, so maybe you'd put another standard in, in place there, like a 100,000 pound standard and a 20,000 pound standard. Uh, these are really good numbers. They're meeting the O2 to O3. However, the discussion that we had and that I'm going down the path changed a little bit when we in introduced automation because before, hey, I wanna maintain better than O2, so I need a second load cell. Well, here, testing, the same, uh, and I'll, I'll go over the uncertainties and what's in them later. Testing it uh, with automation, you can see the improvement's been about two to two and a half times. Why is that? Because, well, our engineers are freaking awesome, uh, is the one reason. And the owner, the, the president of the company, is a pain in the butt and said, I want, I want this automation to hold and I want it to be very, very repeatable. And I gave them a number of 0.001% of, um, of full scale and they looked at me like I was crazy and then two and a half years later they achieved it. So what's basically happening here is the automation is not, it's not overshooting test points significantly. Uh, I mean, everything overshoots. If you wanna hold 10,000 pounds, it might go to 10,000.01, uh, you know, something like that, but it's set up uh, and very controlled. So each force point is repeatable. When you have a technician, it's not uncommon, oh, I wanna apply 10,000 pounds. It, even really skilled technicians will go 10,050, 10,100, and then they'll let it come back down. Unskilled technicians might go to 12,000 and then come back down, and that creates a um, additional error. Hey, they might go to 15,000 and then come back down. If anybody's used a, a UCM with a hand pump or control, they know how easy it is to, uh, just overshoot a test point, and then at which point they should restart their cow, and if they restart their cow, it takes a lot more time. Um, I have blogs on this and what, what's okay for overshoot, what's not okay for overshoot. Uh, the automation always comes in in and, and what's okay for an overshoot is really what I wanna say, but uh, pretty interesting results, and here is the, the improvement on the right here. So. I think you're averaging the the lowest case was uh, 1.838 improvement to the highest case here in there uh, it looks like 3.157. So really on average you're looking at two to two and a half um, 
times improvement somewhere somewhere in there mentioned earlier what makes a good force machine uh, and that's made to minimize off center loading bending and torsion to do this, this force machine needs to be plumb level square rigid free of torsion all these things are virtually impossible it's just getting them to the best level we can we can get uh, you know there's a bubble level that comes with the machine you want to get it better use a machinist level uh, the rigidity, pretty good there. The material, uh, we've in the newer calibrating machines, we've added more material. And when I say added more material, that's meaning adding more material here, uh, adding more material here. Uh, so there's less deflection in it. And free of torsion, look, anything's going to twist that has threads on it. You can use special threads, um, but it's really, let's just keep torsion to an absolute minimum, uh, the lowest we possibly can. And then they're pictured right, that's 100K UCM. Uh, this is a pretty much standard machine, comes with the hand pump. Uh, companies opting for the cheapest option will, will typically buy this and then they'll upgrade to a power control or hopefully upgrade to automation later. If the workload is minimal, this may make the most sense right now. Uh, I think it's painful for a technician to physically pump the pump but the good thing is if anybody remembers the uh, film Popeye or the cartoon Popeye they can get big forearms uh, doing so because there's a lot of pumping to get to 100,000. So easy operation, uh, simple yoke movement, we have a pendant switch on it, uh, reference standards always in compression, uh, reduced errors from misalignment and then you have the sheet online you can go uh, download or not the sheet online you have the sheet that's in the handouts uh the presentation of this you can go click uh for videos or whatever about the machine um, but typically your reference standard only needs that compression cal and that eliminates the need for tension and it's it's pretty easy to operate What's not so easy is when we get into all these force measurement errors. Uh, we cover these in our, our classes, but it's just different proper pin size. And we'll cover some of them today if you're wondering what some of these are. Hardness of plates, you can go to our website, read our blogs. Our new uh, ebook is coming out. That's a free download. So if you reg you can register for that now on our website. Uh, that should be out in May. It's like 300 some pages of all things force, all guidance uh, from talk about the new chat. Uh, I think there's, uh, I, I wrote this over um, a big period of time. I think there's there's new chapters on TEDs. There's new chapters on um, how low can my load cell go. There's just a lot of new chapters in there. I can't remember them all that, that have been added, but a lot of good information. And we've added over 100 pages, uh, I believe, to this uh, this version. But again, free ebook. Uh, if anybody wants to register on our website and the ebook will will talk about all of these errors and more. But if we look at these errors, um, I created this uh, when I train in person, I created this uncertainty sheet here. Um, and basically you, you have a standard budget, if my pen works, you have a standard budget up here. Uh, this is this is our standard budget for uncertainties. You know, reproducibility, repeatability, usually ASTM, uh, lower limit factor. And then all of these things below add a lot of error. And you can see what type of additional uncertainty or error they add uh, when you select them. And these are just different things here. But look, uh, I think everybody's gonna hopefully exercise a load cell, but things that automation helps with overshooting a test point your technicians have have a tendency um very easily to overshoot a test point in which point they usually as i said earlier they should bail on and start over and that gets frustrating i don't know what type of people are in a in, in each in individual's organization but it is frustrating when you're almost done a calibration and you just I, you thought you had it i overshot the test point now i have to start over again uh not not a fun thing different timing profiles with automation you set the timing so uh you know basically you want to hold the force for 30 seconds and take multiple readings not a problem uh other things are 
non-flat base. Other things are usually controlled with adapters, pinch and, uh, like tension, like pin size process, like bolting a load cell, that's also adapters. You have bottom plates or using the right ones, roller bearings, cabling, all of that stuff. So there's lots of different uh, error sources. Then there's some, you know, then there's actual standards uh, that, uh, you know, this one using ASTM E13, but you're just looking at uh, test points. Uh, loading range should not in include forces outside of um, the range of forces applied during use, which is fine. Uh, this this cow's a fine cow, it's, but uh, if it starts at 500, ends at 10,000, the loading range then, the first usable force point is 500, and not 192. Uh, so that's really more about processes. Uh, and then we have full webinars on ASTM. There's other things, torque, see if you're gonna bolt something, the sequence, uh, the torque spec of, of things. Uh, there's batteries, if you're running a lab, do the battery, does the instrumentation have a different output with a full charge versus a depleted charge? Uh, we just took a process to anything that walks in the door we either fully charge it if it has rechargeable batteries before calibration or we put new batteries in it because uh, we don't know loading and bottom threads uh, this is the cow machine the reference stays in in this scenario uh, where it's loaded flat against the base uh, this loading profile whereas some of those other machines i talked about uh, would be this loading scenario and there is a difference so it's important to tell, the reason I keep this slide in this on optimizing universal calibrating machines is if you're using our cow machine, uh, you're gonna want this picture. But if you're using somebody else's where the standard uh, stays in tension and compression, you're gonna want the lab, whatever lab you're sending it to, to replicate how you're using it. And it does make a difference. It's three pounds uh, out of 25,000, uh, which is about 0.012%. People might say that's not a huge difference, but it all is an adder to your overall CMC uncertainty. So if you're adding 0.012%, that is a bias. That's in addition to the uncertainty that you're claiming. If you're claiming 03, have that 012% error, chances are you're really 04, uh, one, two, and or yeah, oh, four, two, and that's where uh, proficiency test and other stuff uh, will, will come up and likely show it. Talk about cow machines, and then you have to talk about adapters uh, and the adapters to reduce errors and keep everything in alignment. Uh, force calibration is very mechanical, uh, keeping the line of force pure, free from eccentric forces is key to anything, and different adapters can change the amount of strain. We have posters, uh, again, follow us on LinkedIn, can't say enough, we'll be, uh, our Steve and our marketing manager will be announcing some, some specific giveaways for followers, people that comment. Um, the other thing we have is, uh, if you come see us at NCSLI, we'll have posters there if you want a poster for the a lab of all the force measurement errors. These are some things that are on the posters, uh, lots more on, on them, but uh, here's something that just just looking, at different errors. People send us load cells without integral adapters. They do it all the time. Now the different depth of thread that we put into it, whether we load it against the shoulder, how far we thread into it, um, all of those, all of that will make a huge difference in the output. Uh, varying hardness and flatness of top blocks. If, if I have something, uh, if somebody purchases a system from us, we will send, we will supply a top block that top block will have a specific hardness that will be married to the load cell. When used with that top block, one should not expect the output to change. If one changes blocks intermittently from like a Rockwell 44 to a 52, um, there's going to be a change in output, probably a 0.3% change, yes really large numbers so you do not want your reference standards you do definitely don't want your reference standards uh, that you're using you don't do not want to be changing blocks because your errors could be quite large if, especially if you're thinking you're at 03 and changing top blocks is going to put a 0.3 percent error that's 10 times what you would claim and then tension links improper pin sizes and then here's some pictures of of that uh, there's a tension link different size pins one you put one pin in, the device reads 49,140. Put a different size pin in, the right size pin in, it reads 50,000. So adapters are just absolutely crucial. 
uh, we had somebody come in for training last year and said, why are you here? They said, because we want to stop going to A's true value for our adapters. So uh, not a good thing. Uh, it's not safe. There's a bent rod end. If, if you have anything bent, there's a grade eight bolt. Uh, this failed after like 350 some uh, load cycles. And then here's something that I was reading recently, and I've put this um, put this in because I thought it was just so interesting. Um, and I don't think this failure is force related, but this uh, that's a Miami Dade condo collapse, and NIST has gotten into the investigation of it, and it's how it was built. And there were some theories if people remember on TV about like the pool water condensation and the parking garage being the problem. Well, the the final report is not going to be out until sometime in 2025. Uh, though, what's interesting about this one is there's like 24 failure hypotheses, and this NIST explored multiple points, and not all of them. Of course, you have 24 potential failures. Not all of them uh, get equal weight, uh, but the main two that NIST came down on were the failure of the column to slab connection at the pool deck and the failure of columns along the south edge of the tower. And then evidence suggested that the pool deck collapsed about four to seven minutes before the tower partially collapsed. You can see this in the video. Uh, this is just scary for everybody and it's a safety concern because what happens if something collapses the people that were in this condo when you have four to seven minutes you probably heard a noise it happened at like 1 30 in the morning or 1 24 in the morning and how are you going to react what was that it's going to take you four to four to five minutes to try to get your bearings and you're not going to probably pop up and evacuate so many people were killed um NIST studied the corrosion of the re rebar um and the degradation of the concrete just a really interesting articles on on this and it also goes into the fact how does this relate to force well it goes into the fact of concrete testing which comes back to uh maybe not this one but several other buildings when they pour concrete and concrete's not tested properly and you use load cells to test uh the machines that then test the the concrete so if you're off uh hardness of adapters you're off 0.3 percent with that uh you might be off a lot of technicians overshooting test points and you're doing all this other stuff you might be off half a percent will that make a difference on the uh, concrete maybe uh maybe on what's being tested but it's an interesting interesting paper uh or, or not paper it's an interesting read and that's why uh i put it in here because that's something that's a little bit more uh recent and it does talk a lot about uh this uh what's called uh punching shear failure and it talks a lot about concrete and how these buildings are built and stress strength analysis and i just find it fascinating so proper adapters for tension links. This is back to more of what we have. Uh, they call this out. Uh, Dylan makes great equipment. That's the stuff here. You can see the extreme, you can see this, um, but it calls it out right on the specification sheet here, E shackle pin diameter. This is the recommendation of what it should be used with. And this is what the expectations are that people will use this uh, when they calibrate these adapters. And if for our universal calibrating machines, we have clevis sets, we have everything, we have pins. Uh, the best thing is to calibrate it with our clevis sets and the customer's pins, but the second best is to use our pins uh, if the customer does not send them in. And then they're just different looking at that. Larger instrument takes smaller pin. Uh, what what that basically is is probably the 20 ton is only sold in north america so it's got a two inch pin the 25 tons probably sold around the world so it's got a 50 millimeter pin which is 1.97 inches but that little bit for those out for those listening the difference of 0.03 inches could be an intolerance versus an out of tolerance and when i said we make uh clevis kits there's uh kits that we make so here's pictures of our cal machine how the adapters work for tension uh believe in lean lean six sigma uh principles uh more so on lean on this side that we wanted to design an easy solution for people to have a clevis set 
have the adapter, use the same adapter that you would use for your load cell, just put put a clevis onto it, uh, really reduce the amount of adapters in the lab. Because uh, prior to this uh, patented design, people used to just buy different clevises for different capacities, use different rods, and then your whole lab would be full of adapters. Um, so, oh, it's quickly switched to calibrate different instrument without disseminating the entire, disassembling the entire setup and improves accuracy and workflow. Hey, the, the amount of time you can save, um, not only it's a time savings, but for those that are out there that are Caltechs, it's just so much easier for you if you're doing these calibrations and breaking down and doing all these different um, tension setups. So, and typically, the, you know, so, some things we do in our lab, this bottom piece can just stay in there uh, if you have a good tension um, tension setup and uh, just leave it in the machine. But anyway, so we have tension member value kits and clevis value kits. Are they really a value? I think they are a great value because of the fact that you have all these quick change adapters for whatever load cell uh, may walk in the door, or if the customer sends their adapters, chances are you will be able to mate to them and not have to go somewhere to, to get something made and have everything throughout the lab. They're nice, they're labeled, you can do the setup, you can do things faster, uh, make the setups, and it makes your technician's life easier. Kind of like having a socket set uh, with all the sockets in the box, uh, the way we case things and, and, and put these out. But hey, it's compare that to having sockets all over the lab and, and somebody going around asking for the seven eights one and nobody knows who it had. John last had it, Julie last had that other one, blah, blah, blah. So different hardnesses of top adapters. Um, I say can produce errors high 0.3% because that's what we tested here. Uh, it can be much higher, it can be less. It just depends on the, the difference of the strength of, of the hardness of the top lock. Like so 42 to 52, you might get a 0.3. If you're down at the 38s or softer, you might get higher, it, depending on how the variability between the hardness. These were different tests they did. Um, and you can see on the side, calibrated this load cell. Same top, same same bottom block both times, just changed the top blocks. And something as simple as that, resulted in a difference of 0 0.307 at the 10% point and 0.263% at capacity and are so easy to correct just by the adapters here talking about concrete and building collapse here's our concrete set um, great field kit uh, this this load cell weighs about 25 pounds this one right here this big one 600,000 at 25,000 our engineer Mark Jones designed it and he just did a fantastic job uh, and these things perform just it's a multi-column cell they perform great uh, hopefully later we'll have some uh, later on in the year we'll have some design uh, stuff and talk about the different load cells uh, we talk about that in our force class for sure. I said about thread depth and loading. Here's a um, a 3,000 pound load cell and just bearing these top adapters on the cell uh, produced a max error of 1.7%. So very, very high error uh, from just switching out adapters. The right thing to do is install an integral adapter, which is in this picture. I recommend everybody buy load cells with this installed. I know that's counterproductive to people saying, I can I can save, but a 10,000 pound load cell, I can save $150 by not installing this. Well, that $150 savings gives you a heck of a lot of potential error, unless you're sending adapters or locking them in for the Cal Lab. So uh, like I said, the solution is just pick the purchased integral adapter, lock it in. Uh, hopefully if you're buying reference standards, lock them into that. And then you have compression adapters, uh, different alignments. Here's, if you're in a cow machine that's under 100,000, this is this is the recommended adapter. These, this particular ball adapter and setup uh, right here, when I did the initial test from what we used to sell back in uh, early 2000s to when we made these around 2010, these improved um, the overall reproducibility condition of the measurement, one of the huge uh, sources of error or ASTM lower limit factor by over um, 30 percent. Uh, so it basically cut a third off of the uh, uh, a big portion of the uncertainty, sometimes a half, but I'm more comfortable saying a third. 
uh, compression adapter solution, everybody might deal with button load cells. These adapters can be mounted in the UCM. And then also adapters for handheld force gauges. Now, the reason this picture's in here is because some people say, hey, how low can I use my UCM to? And it's usually about, so if you have a 100,000 pound machine, it, you're usually gonna be able to use it to generate forces between very well between 1,000 and 100,000. When you go to low forces, you should switch to the, this is the portable machine that goes up to 2,000. And when I, I can't recommend enough that this, this setup on these smaller machines for handheld force gauges and stuff is preferred as to trying to do that in the UCM. So, and you can also do small load cells. So 100K UCM, uh, 2K PCM, you're gonna be able to handle a lot of equipment from at least uh, capacities from at least 10 pounds the whole way up to 100,000. And then as the workload progresses, I, we often recommend putting that another UCM in around 30,000 or 10,000, depending on where all your workload is. And then there's just large adapters we can design and we design huge machines. I mean, we can design machines up to 3 million pounds of force. Some adapters conclusion, um, you know, it's hard to get customers to send the adapters, and that's why we recommend that fail-safe option of, hey, I have these adapters, I can say what I did, I can put that on the customers, I can put that on the certificates, I can have a CYA scenario, I can use the UCM, the Morehouse UCM with my reference standard load cells, calibrate customers' devices using Morehouse adapters, and I can hang back to, so my technicians know if it doesn't come in with an adapter, we're gonna look at the, if it's a tension link, we're gonna look at the uh, manufacturer specs for the recommended pin size, and we're gonna pull it. And we have all of that stuff. Uh, if you wanna know more about adapters, I covered a lot of it in this webinar. You can read our technical paper. UCM automation. Now, we have a UCM. Uh, many of you may have a UCM. The automation can be purchased at any time. Um, you know. It's will work with, I used to say all UCMs, but then we found some that, uh, and I doubt anyone here has them. I think there's only 10 out of the thousands that we've made since the 1950s that it won't work with. So, uh, but I don't want people thinking that it, it can work with some of those. Uh, you need the hydraulic, you need a hydraulic, if your UCM has a hydraulic power control uh, or a hand pump, it can likely be easily upgraded. I've seen some stuff from like the 50s or some one-offs uh, that were made that, that would not be able to. But for the most part, most people we were to have the upgrade. We designed this with a lot of things in mind. Um, programmable control of calibration routines to eliminate entry errors, multiple reason, readings over user-defined period yield and improved average, better representing the calibrated device aver average. So uh, automated high frequency data capture leads to improved and consistency of results. Uh, operator fatigue. So somebody can set an instrument up. Imagine this workflow. Set an instrument up, load your profile. Your, it's not, we call them recipes around here, but load your profile for the device that you want to calibrate. The machine's going to, there's, there's additional safety checks. It's constantly monitoring what's being applied. And the first exercise cycle, it's going to load to 10% of that device capacity and say, is everything okay? I recommend keeping that on. It can be turned off. The technician then says, hey, my alignment's good. Everything looks good. Go go do the cal so then now the technician can go warm up another load cell they can start doing paperwork for the last thing they did the last item they calibrated well that machine is automating so finish warm up the next in line finish paperwork calibrations done do that again now this is where we come to um increasing throughput by 25 to 75 percent because if you're running that process you can do a lot of things. And when I say the paperwork end of things, the UCM will capture all of the data uh, and the technician will need to either load it, either you load it into your system for the additional analysis and printing, or um, we're gonna have some data, uh, we're gonna have some CERT generation. The, the CERT generation is not, uh, not fully available, all scenarios just yet. So, yep. Um, uh, overshooting the points, the tech doesn't need to worry about that. They can, uh, you know, uh, faster, more accurate, and all of that fun stuff. Here's some screenshots of the machines. 
I mean, this isn't going to mean everything to everybody, but you can press, um, you can search for different types of meters. Uh, you can use, um, we even have a camera system that's available. Uh, you can hook a camera up to it. It can take videos of uh, if you're doing a dynamometer or something. We're, we're looking at different systems uh, for things that cannot be automated. But anyway, we're building the meter library, we're sorting this thing. You select your reference meter, select your unit under test, uh, do a lot of different features with it. Uh, and these have been out now. Uh, the automation's pretty new product for us, but they've been being tested for well over uh, a year. But there are exercise cycles. How many exercise cycles do I want? There's uh, right here is the 10% safety point. You can turn that off. Like I said, I wouldn't recommend it. One of one of our customers is constantly squashing load cells. So we put, uh, they're not using our machines, uh, but they want to change to our machines because of because of this. And we also have pressure valves that are monitoring and depending on the meter, there's a feedback control in the meter. So really, the, it's going to be quite, and there are two e-stops on the machine as well. So if somebody's completely not paying attention, uh, they could overload a load cell. It just makes it harder. No system is completely infallible, though we've taken every step um, to to try to mitigate those risks. So here's just a, a simple detailed results on one of the tests we did. We said, hey, we want to take these points immediately. And it did, which then it left to uh, overshoot. So. You can tune this, uh, offset from point. Uh, you can do a lot of different things in it. There's export to CXP, export to a Morehouse template, export to uh, an Excel template. So we tried to do the basics for exporting to anything and everything that, that you may have. Somehow you can get it in. Uh, our engineering team, our programmers can work with you. And then here's some people say, how do I handle different point offsets? Well, here, uh, hold timer starts here look it's this is a thousand um a thousand pound point you can see the overshoot was 0.1 uh pounds from where it was set that could be tuned in and then you can start seeing what's what's going on it's not a uh, whole timer resets whole timer restarts at zero and while it's within this thousand pound uh it's taking 30 seconds readings begin right here um and this is the window 1000 uh, right here, the, the window was set to plus or minus 05, and that's the, the readings, and then getting an average of those readings. Uh, we have a 10 minute video on YouTube explaining it. Uh, that's uh, here's Nick and Joe Kim are putting together some of the automation machines. There's some goober right here. That's a painted picture of Mr. Morehouse beside the goober. And then there's our um, engineer and designer of the machine, James Mole. And if you watch the video, it talks all about overload protect, protection, noise levels, all the stuff that gave him agita. Didn't really give him agita, but I was like, the machine needs to have this, 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 this. And all the stuff we achieved with it uh, was, was pretty phenomenal with that machine and, and what we can do. So UCM uncertainty, questions we get, what's the best uncertainty I can achieve? Can achieve a measurement of certainty better than O2 of applied force with the automation. I showed those pictures. They, you were getting numbers, uh, really, really low numbers in, in that. And then, then, then it also depends on several factors. Uh, you have to look at uh, significant factors to uncertainty. This is just a basic propagation of uncertainty right here where we're talking about uh we took in like the document a2la r2 of five talks about the five r's and an e that's this stuff right here and then you have side load you put it in the machine you're going to have side load sensitivity and uh typically most labs we recommend using reference standards operate to the astm e74 standard that gives you a legal standard to fall back on they call it a lower limit factor with a statistical estimate of errors that's found in section 8 for those that want to look at um, e74 and we just did this paper back in 2017 and i still like it because it talks about tier zero hey we calibrate uh the load cell and dead weight that goes into a cal machine 
So we start out in our dead weight performing calibration, hopefully on your load cell at 016. You put it in the cow machine. This is the 20% force point, and this is without automation. Um, automation is going to lower this a bit, um, but this was that without automation. With with automation, this number is going to come down. Um, UT repeatability is going to come down. Uh, the other stuff is going to remain pretty much constant, unless you buy higher end meters or or whatnot. But yeah, so you're getting around the 20% point without automation around O2 with automation. Yeah, I think the number that we showed would drop it to like 0.13 or something like that. And then you're going to calibrate something for somebody else, and that's what that's where we get to this this tier. A lot easier to show it, uh, I think, this way. We start. Wow, we're starting pretty far down, right? You start with uh, traceability, uh, which basically is a documented, unbroken chain of calibrations, each contributing to the measurement uncertainty. It starts at the SI, we're traceable back to the SI unit. Uh, typically, most labs uh, like us, reference lab, we're sending equipment to NIST or we're having our dead weights calibrated directly by NIST. And then that's going to propagate the uncertainty down to us, however good NIST can do. And then we calibrate things for accredited supplier working standards. And NIST is super freaking awesome. They they hit around four to five parts per million on our 120. They calibrated the weights in our 120,000 pound machine. We hit around eight parts per million. Most accredited calibration suppliers then will hit around 02, somewhere in there. Uh, this is for standard uncertainty. 02 or better. If they're using our cal machine, they're probably hitting uh, better than 01. Uh, then you have working standards and field measurement. So how that works and then you get the adapters uh you put those in the machine mounting your reference the other ones we talked about that to great extent earlier and i always like this picture uh you know the getting into force the force uncertainty saga for many people getting into trouble there's newton apple falls starting to grasp it and then they are measuring the apple uh you could be testing the apple but what I like to think is with all the documentation that we've put out there that we've we've made this a lot easier uh, for people and just comparing things uh, right here, the lower your uncertainty, this this graph shows the more room you have to control your risk and that decision rules paper that's coming out next week. Uh, if you follow us on uh, LinkedIn or if you sign up, we'll make sure you get it. Uh, you can see that I this is basically showing the lar the lower my uncertainty, the more room I have to be in tolerance. And then over here, the picture on the right is showing like, hey, if I got a standard uncertainty here at 10,000 pounds uh, of this, and I try to measure something uh, with a with a specification of plus or minus uh, five pounds, I'm going to have to really be on nominal to make a conformity assessment if I take into account the the uncertainty of the standards. I mean, some people do not do that. That's beyond this webinar right now. I can talk ad nauseum about shared risk and how I hate it uh, because it allows you to pass too much risk to, if you're okay with 50% risk being passed to you, then shared risk might be okay. But uh, besides that, uh, the decision rule paper uh, covers it in a lot more detail. So CMC, uh, calibration and measurement capability for UCM, typically we're gonna look at these uh, per R205. There are more that you would look at. These are the main ones, uh, A2LA, if you're credited by A2LA, you're gonna look at these uh, because you cannot ignore any of these per the R205 document. And we have this online. This is a CMC sheet for force cows. Uh, Basically, uh, this one you can see is just a, this was done in the 200-pound test point, and at the 200-pound test point, you, uh, on a 2K range, you achieved 0.2%. And if we look at different con contributors, here's just looking at that uh, right here. Overall, 
reference standard to perform the calibration. If we're doing, if if your reference standards are not being calibrated by dead weight primary standards with low uncertainties, this is what we're comparing. So if we do a, we work up a full budget. Our budget here, our expanded uncertainty is 0.41 pounds. Uh, we have that calibration with dead weight. The calibration with dead weight is quite low versus if we go to a secondary standard supplier based on the traceability chain. Right here, that same load cell calibrated by a credited supplier, 95.74% of our budget, and instead of 0.41, it's 4.03. So basically, you're absorbing all of the uncertainty, whether you like it or not. Whoever you use to perform your calibration, the best they can do you cannot be better than and in the in the case of primary standards dead weight uh that we looked at here uh there's other co other percentage contributions like stability and stuff that are more dominant uh you you would get an expanded uncertainty from us uh of 0.41 in that with that load cell versus an accredited supplier using secondary standards is going to come out to be about uh, four pounds if you're using the ucm yeah, more if if that if they're using the UCM with automation, that's probably going to get cut in half to like two pounds or less. So there is the in between, and the in between on both between these two, well, not not extremes, but between dead weight or secondary accredited supplier with one of those with a machine that does tension and compression. The in between is basically the the Morehouse UCM with automation. And without automation, you're probably going to really mimic these numbers or close to those numbers maybe you get 3.5 um, pounds and pound uncertainty instead of 4.03 so a little bit of a break i should have taken one earlier uh here we have a few more slides and then we're going to do q a but if you can um look at this uh look at the the question here and if you can answer it that would be great uh, so read it what is the risk of not working with morehouse i know shameless plugs shameless advertisements but this gives me a chance too as you're thinking about this if anybody is so kind and wants to answer it in the chat window this gives me a chance to pull up our website and show you where these uh and get you links to these other documents that i promised would be i'd put in the chat window and I'll also show you these other documents. So uh, the one I put in the chat window now, so you, hopefully you can find it, is the one for uh, the CMC. Uh, it's an Excel sheet to help you do your uncertainties. And then the other one here that I'm gonna put in is why is it give me a chrome extension i don't want that the other one here i'm going to put in is our guidance document for ucm which i'm going to bring over here because i know probably no one wants to really complete that survey but so this one's online it's uh two in the chat windows hopefully you can find them uh the and i'll look at both of them now this one's how to develop an uncertainty budget for morehouse ucm and you can see look at all that's going on here, considerations, uh, different things, ASTM lower limit fact, the reference standard, and it just will go over basically a lot of the stuff we went over today um, and how to do it uh, as well. There's some budgets, there's one, two, three, explaining them all, Reprodu repeatability and reproducibility between technicians should be formed whether it's a change of personnel. It just gives you a lot of good guidance to creating that uncertainty budget. Follow that with, and I'm gonna pull this over here. Uh, this can be found on our website. It's under documents and tools. Lots of different guidance here, force calibration for beginners. Hey, you have somebody new to your organization, maybe you wanna download this. Uh, Maybe you want to download some other stuff, but I wanted to show people the spreadsheet tool here. CMC made easy for force. I put that in the link. We can download it. Just did some uh, little bit of improvements. Someone asked, uh, hey, is this different from the 2022 version or the last version you pushed out? Yes, it is different from the last version. We've 
pushed out. Uh, not significantly, but there were some code changes and bug fixes. And when I say that, the CMM, the CMC summary for those that already were using this still works the same as it did. There were some things that were changed in here uh, under the data analysis and summation of the data and some formulas uh, changed now, more error checking. Uh, previously, if you didn't have 11 points, it would kind of, it would work for you, uh, except for these, um, some of these numbers would not come down for an overall summation of it. So that was fixed, some other stuff was fixed, but here, I mean, this this sheet is probably one of the most comprehensive sheets. You start with instructions. Hey, I don't know what these definitions are. We defined a lot of them in here, uh, what they are. Then there's an, the worksheet. This is where you go with R&R &R between technicians. So this will check between your different technicians. Um, that is the CMC summary sheet. There's even like, how do I calculate resolution? And there's even a really generic PT. When I said we have a better PT sheet, we have a much better PT sheet uh, currently than this uh, that I'm showing you right there. But let me see if I can show you something that's more filled out as far as these forms go. Here's one. Uh, repeatability and reproducibility filled out, CMC summary, everything's filled out. You can see expanded uncertainty. Um, this is a UCM. This is a 10,000 pound load cell in the UCM. And you can see at 10,000 pounds, uh, 0.0657%. Uh, you can also see at the 10% point, 0 0.0379. This is one that has uh, automation uh, with it. but what what you can do is you can look at the different points in this sheet right here's uh the 10,000 pound point here's r and r between texts here's repeatability we can say hey what's our largest source of error here and on this sheet the largest source of error is uh the stability of the reference standard from one calibration to the next so if i wanted to lower my uncertainty what would i do knowing that that's our largest source of error, I would decrease the stability, right? Maybe it's something else that's going to be the largest source of error. Now, this is at capacity. See, I'll show everybody this. See the ASTM lower limit factor here? At capacity, it's 0.58%. If we go to 10% point, 1,000 pounds, ASTM lower limit factor is 1327 if we go to our first point uh, here, which is 200, ASTM lower fact factor is 27, because that's a constant, it's not changing. Now stability, still 33.96%, uh, however, repeatability be start, is starting to become dominant on those low force points. And we're at, on a 2% point on a 10,000 pound load cell, uh, in this example, we're at 0.5%. So when I say you're gonna need to change standards, it's uh, you might get be able to do 10% to 100%, but going below 10% is going to be very, very diff difficult. But again, this is an actual budget, uh, one that was created, and you can see the numbers. And in addition, it does the best fit scenario where you kind of get a little bit of, uh, it makes sure that not every point's going to fit. And you can see that in this graph, I can certainly blow it up. You can use a higher order degree fit. I think that um, in some cases, uh, we took that out on this one, uh, but the actual uncertainty and calculate uncertainty best fit, the reason we took it out is because a lot of ABs will not use you know, higher order polynomials for fits. But you can see the actual uncertainty was lower than the, the best fit here. And we just had dip, maybe we have a little bit better repeatability or not. You can take out test points. Uh, uh, say, hey, I don't want that 200 pound test point. I can exclude that from my numbers. And if I do that, then what happens? I mean, these, I might get a little bit better fit over here. Just lots of versatility with this. Uh, I encourage anybody to, to download that, go to our website, mhforce.com, and you can see all the stuff that's here. There's technical papers on adapters, all of that. So please grab those from the chat. 
So there it is. There's what I showed you. There's also a document uh, that we published that we wrote for A2LA. We got a lot of different help. And common risk with most force calibration laboratories and machines. Uh, if you're not using the sheets, I see a lot of incomplete uncertainty budgets missing major con contributors where their uncertainties are way low. Depending on your AB, uh, that's the accreditation body, they may come in and give you a ding. That is one ding that you normally do not want to have because if you issued a lot of certificates and now they're saying your uncertainty is double what it used to be, are you going to recall everything? So we wrote some guidance documents on that. I showed you where they were. Lack of understanding the standards. Uh, you know, I don't like to boast about ourselves, but we did help draft many. Uh, then we have the PFA, probability of false accept. That's risk. Uh, we have a tool to help our customers. That's online as well. And we have that document that's coming back. And more, more so than anything, uh, the lab does not replicate how instruments are used by using the right adapters. Uh, you saw the errors in this presentation. Even if you do purchase a CAL machine or you do purchase an automation upgrade, if you're not using the right adapters, it's, your error sources can be super large as a 0.3 with the top block, the um, 1%, uh, over 1% with the wrong pin on the tension links. Uh, 012, that's not a super large error uh, for most people, but 012 from loading against the base versus not. And there are more and more of those adapters, overshooting test points, lots of other things uh, in there as well. So uh, making better force measurements starts with the right equipment. Uh, we are not the end all be all of the right equipment. There's several good manufacturers. Hopefully though, we, hopefully we provide the best overall value. Uh, we have dead weight. We build dead weight machines. Uh, they're not as easy to build as it looks uh, from the ones that we have. We build all our machines ourselves. We've installed uh, machines in the Air Force, uh, this, uh, installed them in NMIs worldwide. They are the current Beth method, uh, uh, the lowest uncertainty method uh, to calibrate. Uh, maybe someday we'll, we'll have more on the kibble principle and there'll be something better. Uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Then this webinar was mainly about the universal calibrating machine. We build those. We have 100Ks in stock. If you're looking at lead times on any of this, if you're looking at lead times for an automation, we're running about eight weeks on an automation. If you're looking at a lead time for a UCM, uh, if somehow you have to convince your management on separate purchases and want to buy a UCM this year, automation next year, not a problem whatsoever. Uh, these things, they, they do come piecemeal where you don't have to buy them all together so you can limit the, the overall out-of-pocket cost if you want. I, I would prefer to get it all right now, train the technicians all right now, but I know that's not a, a factor for everybody. So just know that. Uh, know there is an upgrade path. If, if you just started doing calibrations and you don't have that much work, uh, maybe manual does still make sense. So uh, easy upgrade path there. Uh, if you already have machines and you took this uh, webinar, maybe think about your workload and when the technicians are changing standards. If you want to download our CMC sheet and, and go through that, maybe it might make sense that you have a standard at, maybe you have a 100K and a 10K standard. Maybe it might make sense to have a 25K standard. I don't know. It's a, You just gonna have to evaluate uncertainties. You have to uh, evaluate your overall workload and, and figure out what best, best makes sense for your operations uh, and your technicians. Um, their attitude, uh, people's attitude, culture is everything. So if you're investing in better equipment that's going to make their life easier, uh, you think that they're going to be shopping for jobs. You think that they're going to, uh, you know, continue to want to come to work each day. Well, yes, if you're making their lives easier, they should absolutely. Look, we're in a talent crunch uh, for everybody that's out there. Train technicians uh, and uh, divert a little bit. Look at pilots. We didn't have enough pilots, and now they extended ages. We didn't have. We don't have enough air traffic controllers. So. Um, and Cal technicians are a pool that they don't talk about much, but not many train. The armed services used to train a lot more people. So if we can make things easier and the more we can idiot proof things, such as those overload protections and everything else that's associated with the machine, I didn't even go into all the other stuff it does. It records all the raw data, which is a requirement of ISO IEC 17025. I know some other machines do not do that. If somebody asks you for the raw data, 
you're not going to find it. Uh, you're going to see 10,000 pounds was applied. These were the readings we got. You're not going to see 9,999 was applied and we corrected it to 10,000 pounds. Um, you're not going to see any of that stuff. Uh, so just um, there's so much more there. OSHA decibel levels. We said it operates quietly. Well, OSHA has uh, noise protections required if it's over. But you don't want your technicians to go go deaf running the machine. You don't want all this other stuff. So ta the ca talent crunch is real. And the more you can do to safeguard your facility, streamline your process, increase uh, workflows that are beneficial not only for you, but for the person that's doing the, the calibration, the more chance you're going to have to retain your workforce. Um, so the other piece of that is a uh, calibration provider who has measurement process and capable of meeting your needs and follows published standards. That's showed you a little bit about the, the standards uh, there, bright adapters, um, and then measurement uncertainty. Look, if, if we don't calculate measurement uncertainty correctly, we do not have measurement traceability. And if we do not have measurement traceability, what is that overall value of that calibration? So. Last thing, uh, I have a couple more slides here, and then if you, if anybody on here that's still left that I didn't put asleep, um, wants to ask some questions, if they would type them in the chat, now's your time to start doing that. As I ramble on uh, some things uh, that that some problems that hopefully you can consider, and this is shipping and receiving. Uh, we talked about the cow machines, talked about everything else, but uh, talked about employees and culture and how to retain people, maybe make their life easier. Uh, this one is, look, if you do everything right and then you do not ship instruments to customers properly and they get broken, it kind of invalidates everything. So uh, the picture on the left is Pelican cases. We have laser cutters, we custom cut foam. Uh, highly recommended. Uh, you can buy Pelican Storm cases, Royal case. There's all kinds of them that you can buy, hard shipping uh, cases. Uh, I would, if you have equipment, I would, I would suggest significantly, I would suggest investing in better shipping cases, especially if you've had some damages, evaluate your risk as the standard requires. Then if you're sending stuff out to the supplier, uh, it makes it so much easier for your reference standards to go out in these cases. The the good um, here is double boxed uh, set here. And then we have bad, like this custom blow foam, heavy load cell and cable. We see a lot of sheared cables in this scenario. And then the ugly, uh, this originally was a wood crate that went out, uh, fell off, busted up, and someone rewrapped it. So um, it's tough. Uh, the UPS, FedEx, all, all of them, uh, you know, them honoring shipping claims is is gotten worse and in, and it's a headache talking about employee engagement if somebody's fighting shipping claims all day that is one of the least fun jobs in the world um i probably would rather be the, the on that show the least fun i'd probably be ra be be in the sewer uh cleaning out the sewer with protective gear than trying to fight claims all day but don't hold me to that uh i just cannot stand uh trying to do warranty claims and uh, shipping claims for some companies. Um, so there's our system. The automated control will work on our scale press. Uh, I did, probably didn't completely mention that, uh, but if you have one of these and want an automated upgrade, it will work there. Uh, there's a standalone machine and there's a 30K just picture with automation. And like I said, uh, we have we have stock. Uh, we built stock in the first quarter uh, because we know that there's an interest in in these machines. So large inventory of adapters, load cells, 4215 plus, C705P and other things. So everybody has this in the handouts. You have the links in the chat. Uh, encourage you to go check out our YouTube channel. There's some educational videos on there. Uh, encourage you to go to our free downloads, uh, download uh, not only this sheet, but check out what else we have. Cannot stress enough that if you follow us on LinkedIn, that would be super, super awesome. Uh, as far as that's where the first announcements go out. Newsletters go out every month. Uh, I think we try to provide as much value as possible. Articles on better tips for calibration. The other exciting thing we have is we have a new series coming out to watch for. And that is if you have new technicians or existing technicians, 
part of our training routine besides in-house and shadowing and reading standards and doing all this other fun stuff to onboard a technician is our team, each member of our team gets uh, weekly emails, uh, which is which are sent out Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And each one of them is about a 10 minute read on things force, how to make better measurements. They are not advertisements for Morehouse um, at all. I think out of 106 emails, there's like two that relate to uh, uh, advertising. So very, very low. Uh, some of them will ask to go watch a, a video. Uh, one of those videos is on lead time. I don't want to dissuade anybody, but that's one of those advertisement pieces. Um, out of them, overall, out of 100 and some um, emails, the majority, the vast majority of those are are things like, hey, here's definitions, nonlinearity, here's some adapters, here's how to make better measurements. Uh, really just trying to solidify everything. Here's how meters work. Here's how coefficients work. Here's how ASTM lower limits cal calculated. And then we have a little bit of torque in there. We also have how load cells are designed in there. We have uh, what how to select load cells. Uh, why we chose that selection because of the design characteristics of it. So lots of information that will be coming out. That is over a 35 weeks of three times a week emails, um, about a half an hour uh, each week that would just continuous education and continuous learning for people. So watch out for that. Um, that's all the things I have. Decision rule document will be out next week if you're struggling with decision rules. That document has formulas, VBA code. It has everything in it. We've struggled too long with decision rules. Hopefully the three of us uh, with some help from uh, two other people can simplify this for everybody and your time is valuable and hopefully you've you've learned something in this process listening to me ramble about cow machines uncertainty and adapters and everything else. So that being said, I'll stay on if a couple questions come in. It is 1119. I'm happy to answer them. I've not seen much be going on in, in the actual chat, so I don't know who's out there and, and what people are doing, though um, welcome the questions if you have them. So for the presenters of webinars, this is like the worst part of the day, you know, thinking like if somebody asked a question, crickets, did everybody get what they need? If they didn't, um, now's their time to get some free advice. If if they did, fantastic. Um, like I said, your time is valuable and I hope you learned something. Or if you didn't learn anything, maybe you'll learn something the, the next time or on LinkedIn, read a cool article or download this and click some of the links I had, especially that Miami-Dade condo collapse. I, I can't say how cool it was reading about that and other uh, other failure. Not never cool. Re it's interesting reading about fail fail failures, but never cool uh, that they happen. So. All right. Well, thank you all uh, for for sticking it out. I saw a couple of people uh, dropped off, but uh, this will be available. Uh, the recording will be available if you if you want to show it to anybody. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. If you're examining a cow machine or uh, anything else, uh, give us a contact. And thanks for your time. Take care, everyone. Hope to see everybody on the May 2nd, the force of decision rules. With that, I'm going to end this in three, two, one. Thanks again.